Dear colleagues, we are starting right now. I'm very glad to welcome you to our conference, uh, to our conference, this first conference on new materials and uh, high technologies, in particular to the session Functional Materials and Coatings. Today we continue our session and uh, I will be the chairman of the session and uh, my name is Oksana Ivanova. In the beginning, I would like to say some important things. Um, our first yesterday experience uh, made us draw some conclusions. Um, if you want uh, to ask questions, please uh, don't wait uh, for the end of the talk. Please ask your questions during the talk. Then, our conference uh, is uh, international and the language is uh, English, of course. But if you have if you experience some difficulties with speaking in English, don't worry, don't afraid of it. it. It's not a competition in English. And for that, we have uh, two interpreters and they will help you interpret your Russian speech into English. Okay. Um, um, what about the time? Uh, of course, we have a schedule and we should keep it. Uh, and uh, 30 minutes are allowed for the talks, um, uh, for invited talks, uh, including five minutes for questions, and uh, 20 minutes are allowed uh, for talks, uh, normal oral talks, uh, including five uh, minutes for questions too. Uh, I think that's all I would like to, to say. It's now time to introduce uh, our first speaker, a guest speaker with an invited talk. Uh, Alek Hassana from Tomsk Polytechnic University, and the title of his talk is uh, Metal Ceramic Nanocomposite for Radiation Shooting of Electronics. Alek, accept, please accept the invitation to be on air to be a lecture. lecturer. Thank you very much, dear chairman. Uh, good afternoon the participants of our web conference. Uh, let me start my presentation regarding metal ceramic nanocomposite for radiation shielding of electronics. It's okay? Communication? Yeah, yes, yes. Thanks. Please, please, please. please. Mm -hmm. Stop the talk. Um, there is uh, very important uh, problem and topical task now uh, to improve radiation protecting materials, uh, taking into account the uh, necessary of uh, radiation shielding of electronics and control equipment for spacecrafts, nuclear power engineering, particle accelerators, etc. Um, and uh, to solve this task, it is necessary uh, to solve also uh, current problems. Uh, there are high specific weight of these shielding materials and um, necessity to shield um, electronics against uh, combined radiation like electrons, protons, gamma rays and neutrons. Uh, you can see that uh, the Earth uh, is uh, <clears throat> uh, covered by the uh, many kinds of uh, radiation belts uh, from electrons, uh, uh, also from uh, gamma rays by the protons and uh, neutrons from uh, sun, uh, neutrons, albedo neutrons, uh, and other kinds of uh, radiation um, components. Um, of course, uh, this problem should be solved and now uh, uh, many companies and many producers um, uh, have, um, and, um, have uh, their approaches to uh, solve the mentioning problem. For example, in Russia, this is a joint stone stock company Argon. Uh, which uh, carry out serial production of the radiation um, serial production of the radiation shield uh, uh, 
by the cases, by, by the producers, pro, pro, production of the cases um, for, for microelectronics uh, to protect it uh, against the radiation, uh, radiation uh, components. And uh, these cases are made uh, of uh, aluminum magnesium alloys. So this is boxes uh, which are um, which can be used for uh, installation of, of uh, electronic uh, uh, chips and other um, uh, devices inside this box. Uh, another approach is uh, production of the metal ceramic housing for uh, uh, integration circuits. Uh, circuits. Um, this is so-called the system in housing. Uh, such systems uh, are made by the uh, Honeywell company, um, Peregrine Semiconductors company, Aeroflex company in USA, and some similar production um, also um, is used by the European uh, Aeronautic Defense and Space Company. <coughs> uh, this is the interesting approach by the uh, Atmel uh, Corporation uh, from European uh, Space Agency. Uh, they use uh, speciali uh, specialized electronic components base uh, uh, and they apply the special isotope uh, boron 11 for uh, production, production of chips uh, and uh, this isotope is uh, um, very useful and to shield against uh, neutrons. Um, we uh, tried to uh, apply another approach uh, for radiation shielding of electronic components. Uh, uh, this approach um, is um, uh, is its appro approach relate uh, relates with using the composites consisted of light metal matrix and super fine powder inclusions, uh, powder inclusions um, as uh, uh, radiation absorbent components. Uh, 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 for this purpose, uh, uh, it can be used uh, the method of, of extrusion shaping to shape bars from composite consisted of aluminum magnesium alloy plus dispersed boron carbide or boron uh, nitride powder as a neutron radiation protector and also uh, it is necessary to uh, include uh, dispersed tungsten nanopowder as gamma radiation protector. Uh, so this composite can be uh, effective material uh, for shielding of electronic components uh, uh, against uh, uh, flows of electrons, flows of neutrons and flows of gamma rays and also uh, the thickness of, of this box, uh, of this material, should be enough to protect against protons also. And uh, our work uh, is related to, uh, to um, development of application of spark plasma sintering technique to sintering required metal matrix composites having hard ceramic and refractory metal inclusions. So we use not uh, extrusion uh, method of production of such composite, but we use uh, the uh, effective spark plasma sintering technique, uh, instant uh, sintering, um, and um, the goal to use uh, of, to, for development uh, of such uh, uh, technology uh, are first uh, of all it is modeling and experimental verification of consolidation of composites by SPS technique and this composite consists of aluminum magnesium alloy powder uh, this is a, a commercial powder uh, AMG6 plus boron carbide uh, powder and plus tungsten nanopowder and uh, then uh, we uh, carried out optimization of the composite content 
and spark plasma sintering conditions to achieve higher density. Um, this slide uh, shows uh, the method uh, of hot extrusion shaping of composites, uh, which is the, uh, uh, aimed to uh, shaping of some bars uh, by extrusion method. Um, but uh, the uh, maximal density which can be achieved by this method is just 95% density. So it is not full dense uh, composite, it is some porous materials, uh, ma material which uh, uh, has uh, around 5% of the pores. It is not so good uh, for uh, application in some uh, uh, spacecrafts uh, or power uh, nuclear engineering. Uh, we need the full dense material for uh, this purposes. Uh, and we tried to apply spark plasma sintering method to sinter required metal matrix composites uh, having full density. Uh, for this purpose, uh, we used the following facilities uh, for modeling uh, experimentation. Uh, it was the uh, spark plasma sintering installation space. Uh, of 515 as syntax uh, uh, installation at our laboratory. Uh, then we used also uh, um, processing uh, by the hydraulic precision uh, pressing uh, by the uh, commercial uh, one side uh, hydraulic uh, press. Um, uh, we used it uh, also to study uh, the plot of the uh, density curves uh, of dry mixed composite powders to uh, uh, to understand the behavior of powder, this composite powder during pressing. And then after this pressing, uh, uh, the composite pellets uh, uh, were uh, sintered uh, by vacuum furnace uh, from Nebertor Corporation. Uh, and uh, radiation uh, protect, protected pro radiation protection properties we uh, study by the facilities uh, of the research nuclear reactor at Tom's Polytechnic University. This is uh, IRTT uh, experimental uh, nuclear reactor. Uh, for the uh, in our work, you know, for our work, we used experimental channels of collimated neutrons and also uh, gamma rays uh, from the uh, spectrum of uh, nuclear reactor. Also, we uh, tested uh, the, some uh, gamma ray isotopes uh, uh, like cobalt-57, uh, uh, cobalt-60, and cesium-137. Uh, For modeling uh, of the composite uh, structure, we used uh, the discrete element uh, method uh, for modeling particle packing, uh, then uh, discrete element method for modeling particle deformation, uh, and uh, also we used a special uh, Q-form 3D code uh, for el finite element method uh, for modeling densification process. And experimental characterization uh, of the uh, studied uh, composite. Uh, we carried out by the XRD analysis, <coughs> scanning electron microscopy, uh, having uh, uh, energy dispersion uh, spectra, spectral analysis. Uh, also, we used uh, particle analyzer by laser diffraction, uh, uh, installation and device for measurement of the specific surface <coughs> of the uh, studied powders. And then <clears throat> we tested mechanical properties uh, of the obtained materials by nano indentation and micro indentation technique. Uh, here you can see uh, the composite, uh, the, the um, characterization of the uh, aluminum magnesium powder. Uh, um, this is distribution of particle size. Uh, uh, and uh, XRD characterization. We, uh, <clears throat> we, uh, 
we, we see uh, that uh, our powder, the, this powder was uh, had uh, pure uh, phases of aluminum and magnesium, and then <clears throat> it was the micrometric powder with the particle size from one micrometer uh, up to 50 micrometers. Uh, what is about uh, um, mor morphology of the, this powder? This is uh, uh, relatively spheric particles, spherical uh, particles uh, uh, with the shape near sp spheres. Um, then uh, characterization of the uh, boron carbide powder. It was a commercial uh, powder produced by the uh, Bor, uh, uh, company from uh, Russia, uh, Dzerzhinsk uh, uh, company uh, from the Dzerzhinsk and a laser diffraction analysis showed that this uh, powder had uh, the was submicrometric powder uh, with the particle size from around uh, 100 nanometers up to 10 micron, microns and uh, the average particle size w was around one micrometer. Uh, phase composition uh, was uh, for uh, of this powder was uh, uh, as for uh, boron carbide pure uh, phase. Uh, we we didn't uh, found any impurities in this powder. And this is the morphology of the boron carbide powder. Uh, which had a uh, equiaxial particle shape and not not spherical. And uh, at last, uh, tungsten powder. It was the bimodal uh, powder having uh, two modes of the uh, particle size. One mode what was nanometric uh, particles uh, from uh, around 50, nano, uh, 50 nanometers up to uh, 0 0.4 nanometers, uh, uh, 400 nanometers, sorry, 400 nanometers. And uh, another mode um, uh, had the particles uh, from uh, 500 nanometers up to 10 micrometers. And phase, um, uh, phase composition of such powder was, was also pure tungsten. Uh, this powder was produced by the method of the uh, wire explosion. Uh, at Tomsk Polytechnic University. Uh, and also we studied the morphology of this powder. It was also a uh, spherical particle shape. So this characterization of all three components of the powder uh, allows, uh, allows us to, uh, um, to achieve the correct, uh, correct approach for modeling of the packing of these different powders in one mixture. Uh, and finally, it, it was found that the, uh, uh, we, uh, we know, uh, we studied the uh, particle, uh, particle size and specific surface of this powder. Uh, so, uh, Uh, so uh, it was the necessary uh, experimental data for correct modeling of the particle packing uh, of the mixture components. Uh, and for each particle type parameters of uh, distribu uh, for distribution functions were corresponded to the uh, given uh, content 65% uh, of aluminum magnesium alloy 15% of the boron carbide and 20% of tungsten nanopowder. Um, uh, owing to this approach, we could uh, to calculate uh, the particle coordination, uh, pa partial coordination number for particles uh, uh, consisted of the composite. And uh, it, it was found that uh, the maximum value of this uh, partial coordination number is for optimized, optimized uh, composite uh, consistent. Uh, this uh, 
average, uh, this maximum, maximum coordination number was uh, 7.53 for the uh, optimal composition and consisted of 74% of the aluminum magnesium alloy powder, 6% uh, of the boron carbide powder and 20% weight person, percent of the tungsten nanopowder. Uh, in volume it was uh, around uh, 90 um, 89 percent for aluminum magnesium matrix uh, and the inclusions uh, from the boron carbide uh, micro powder micrometric powder 7.5 percent and 3.3 percent of the tungsten uh, so um, then we used this optimal composition for uh, uniform packing of the different three different particles in one uh, composite mixture and uh, we can see the uh, optimized composite content uh, without um, any bubbles or large pores uh, in this mixture before sintering just before sintering uh, uh, left picture is the free feeling a uh, free feeling of the composite components and right picture uh, shows the stage of 25 percent deformation uh, of plastic uh, aluminum and magnesium particle um, also uh, i need to pay your attention that um, it was a special task to provide the appropriate temperature of sintering because of aluminum magnesium matrix is very uh, has very light temperature uh, very uh, small temperature of the sintering around 60, 660 degrees C. But boron carbide and tungsten uh, have very high uh, sintering temperature, uh, more than uh, 1,800 um, uh, deg uh, 1, degrees C uh, for boron carbide uh, powder, for example. So it was necessary to uh, find the optimal sintering temperature without uh, melting, uh, without melting of the uh, aluminum magnesium powder as a uh, matrix and without uh, 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 segregation uh, of different components uh, inside of the volume of the sintering composite. So, uh, analysis of obtained packs uh, of the composite components showed uh, impossible uh, impossibility of sintering uh, of this component to achieve high density without melting of the aluminum magnesium alloy um, uh, after pressing. Uh, and uh, this conclusion has been proved experimentally. Absence of shrinkage after the vacuum sintering at temperature from 150 degrees C up to 600 degrees C. No shrinkage uh, of mixed and pressed composite powder. Uh, and uh, in this case, we obtained just 85% of density. And densification of the composite uh, at temperature uh, lower than melting point of the aluminum magnesium alloy is possible only owing to plastic deformation and forced flow of the matrix aluminum magnesium alloy uh, intrusion into pores between dispersed hard, uh, hard inclusions, uh, high refractive refractive uh, inclusions of form as boron carbide and tungsten. Uh, for this, um, for modeling of such sintering uh, process, we used the uh, special uh, um, equation, uh, logarithmic equation of dimensionless form, uh, taking into account the uh, co compaction pressure. Uh, pressure uh, during sintering. Um, here we, we, you can see the uh, plots of, of the uh, uh, compaction uh, com uh, plots of the uh, densification of such composite powder and for each powder uh, we calculated the constant uh, for the mentioned logarithmic equation uh, of the densification. A full dense mixed composite can press it at uh, very high uh, 
critical uh, pressure around 5 gigapascal uh, without sintering, without temperature, uh, tem temperature treatment. Uh, but if we apply also uh, during, during pressing, if we apply temperature uh, by spark plasma sintering uh, technique, we can allow uh, full density uh, with pressing uh, around uh, 100 megapascal. Uh, here you can see the uh, equation for modeling of the composite consolidation process, taking into account uh, the um, activation energy of creep uh, of the densification, which define uh, specific heat uh, of the material transition to fluidity. Uh, and some another uh, experimental uh, um, experimental uh, parameters like porosity, temperature, pressure of the pre-pressing, um, and empirical constants uh, for uh, this process processing, uh, for consolidation of the composite mat material. Uh, but uh, also we used another model for uh, theoretical uh, modeling of, of this consolidation, using also this logarithmic equation of compaction and taking into account uh, as the pressing um, influence as well uh, temperature influence during uh, spark plasma sintering. Uh, finally, we found the optimal parameters for sintering. Uh, this is the curve of uh, uh, heating of this composite. Maximal temperature was around uh, 570 degrees C, and in this case, uh, our experimental shrinkage of this uh, composite was uh, uh, um, was correlated correlated with the theoretical modeling, uh, theoretical modeling, uh, like uh, model uh, model two, uh, model two, uh, using a logarithmic equation of the consolidation. Uh, um, finally, it was found uh, the optimal uh, uh, conditions, optimal modes uh, for achieving the best elastic plastic properties of the sintered composite samples by spark plasma uh, sintering. Uh, and we found that the uh, uh, t temperature of the STS uh, um, processing uh, is uh, 5 uh, 490 degrees C uh, during 10 minutes, we can achieve full dense composite, full dense composite without porosity, uh, having uh, high uh, uh, young modulus, uh, uh, good level of the material flow, which is creep at constant load by indenture, and uh, good values of the relative part of the material elastic deformation at nano indentation. And this composite had the maximum value of the weakers, weakers micro hardness. So it is the uh, 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 result uh, which solved uh, our goal to achieve to center full dense composite without porosity with uh, uh, relatively uh, higher uh, mechan uh, mechanical properties. What is about radiation shielding of this sintered uh, full dense composite? Uh, this composite uh, showed that um, uh, coefficients for thermal and super thermal neutrons shielding uh, and uh, for gamma radiation uh, for attenuation coefficient, uh, attenuation coefficient uh, against gamma radiation such parameters were higher than for pure aluminum magnesium alloy uh, as a, a initial uh, initial material for shielding uh, uh, boxes uh, attenuation coefficient for gamma quantum uh, for gamma rays uh, uh, was uh, 1.3 34 times more than for pure aluminum magnesium alloy and for neutrons, thermal and super thermal neutrons, this attenuation coefficient was uh, 
2.2 times more than for pure aluminum magnesium alloy. Uh, these results uh, uh, were published uh, in the uh, uh, several uh, articles, journals. As conclusion, uh, I can say that lightweight metal ceramic aluminum magnesium uh, matrix nanocomposite consisted of also uh, from uh, in inclusions of the boron carbide powder and tungsten nano nanopowder. This uh, composite was consolidated uh, by spark plasma sintering technique up to uh, full density, up to 100% uh, of density. And uh, density of such material, absolute density, uh, absolute, um, density was uh, 3.1 gram per cubic centimeter. And it was found the optimal uh, modes of the spark plasma sintering uh, uh, at, at temperature and pressure during SPS. The other but full dense uh, composite uh, was uh, had attenuation coefficient for gamma rays uh, higher uh, for gamma rays and for neutrons, uh, thermal and super thermal neutrons was higher uh, than for pure aluminum magnesium alloy. Uh, logarithmic compaction equation in dimensional less form modified by the component describing the deformation at temperature, temperature treat, treatment change uh, is um, temperature change and temperature treatment was adequate for modeling of the composite consolidation and arbitrary uh, changes of the uh, spark plasma sintering parameters. Uh, at the same time, static one-side pressing of the dry mixed uh, composite powder at, uh, at uh, 800 megapascal allows to achieve the density around uh, 9, 93 percent. But compaction using powerful ultrasound assistance provides the density up to uh, 90, more than uh, 95 percent. It was higher than for extrusion, hot extrusion method just uh, pressing using a uh, powerful ultrasound assistant. But this is a special approach. Um, it takes uh, uh, additional time to um, show such results. Uh, free vacuum sintering doesn't allow consolidation of the composite up to full density. And the optimal component ratio for the studied composite according to criterion of the high density is uh, as following uh, of such values. Uh, this work uh, was supported uh, by the Russian uh, Ministry of Education and Science, State assign Assignment Assist Science, and we are thankful to Engineer Enikin for the radiation testing uh, experiments. Uh, this uh, technique was uh, patented in Russia. Uh, spark plasma sintering of such uh, aluminum composite and uh, such results uh, were uh, approved uh, by the uh, several conferences uh, in uh, Kazan, uh, Air Space Technologies in two, uh, 2016 uh, year. And we obtained two diploma uh, from uh, uh, International uh, Military Technical Forum Army uh, last year, Army uh, 2019. And this year, this August, uh, the uh, diploma of the Army 2020. So, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I will explain. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. It was very interesting. So many awards. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, Alek Leninovich, you have questions? Can you please answer them? Can you see okay. the questions? On your right uh, in the box, can you see the questions? Uh, maybe do you want me to read uh, these questions to you, or you can do it by your own? Uh, uh, what was the planetary ball mill parameters of powders mixing time and load? Was it performed in protective atmosphere? Uh, no, we didn't use any special atmosphere for ball milling uh, mixed powder, just in air. Uh, and uh, time and, and load uh, was uh, time was around one hour 
uh, and load was uh, characterized for the uh, conventional ball milling process. Uh, we used the balls from zirconia uh, and uh, load was not so high to protect, to protect these zirconia balls uh, against uh, the, uh, some cracking. Um, Okay, you have uh, more questions. Uh, for example, from Olga Skoda, can you see it? Uh, in, in the common chart on your right, can you see it? The first, uh, the first button at the top of the screen. I don't, uh, uh, I can't see the, this question. Okay, question. I, I, I can read. Please. What time do you use for mechanical activation? Um, in your research, we, we, we didn't use uh, special mechanical activation. We used powerful ultrasound assistant to compact the composite powder uh, with the uh, uniform density inside of the uh, uh, who, uh, uh, f uh, inside of the volume of such composite powder. Yes, this is, it was the kind of the mechanical activation by the mm -hmm. uh, treatment uh, of the powerful uh, ultrasound. And uh, in this case, we used uh, power of ultrasound around um, 3 kilowatt and during uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Our plasma sintering, we didn't use uh, mechanical activation. It was the directly uh, sintering uh, uh, at uh, around 500 degrees C during 10 minutes uh, with the loading around um, 80 megapascal. Okay, one more question from Olga Škoda. Have you experimentally studied the internal structure of agglomerated and spherical particles? The internal structure. Uh, did, did you study? Internal structure. We, yes, uh, yes. we studied just, uh, just uh, morphology of the pure powders. And then uh, we saw that after uh, compaction uh, at the, uh, by the static pressing, uh, we, we didn't achieve any deformation uh, and uh, morphology of the powder was spherical for aluminum magnesium alloy and for tungsten, but uh, some flake shapes uh, from the boron carbide powder. Mm -hmm. And uh, two questions from Anton Baranowski. Have you studied differences between sintering pro products using simple powder mixtures and with mechanical activation? So uh, a diff difference between sintering products mm -hmm. and uh, uh, and uh, uh, I repeat, I can't understand this question. Have you studied difference between sintering products using simple powder mixtures and with mechanical activation? Okay. Um, um, have you studied difference between products sintering uh, uh, with mechanical activation and without mechanical activation? I understand this question um, <clears throat> in such a way. Without mechanical activation by SPS processing, we obtain full dense composite. But if we used just uh, um, pressing uh, using uh, using the uh, powerful ultrasound assistance, we obtained uh, the composite having sorry, we obtained we obtained the composite having just um, ninety five percent uh, of relative density. This mm -hmm. uh, this conclusion. Uh, so, mechani mechanical activated powder uh, uh, by the powerful ultrasound assistance with following sintering uh, could achieve um, just 90, 95% of density, but spark plasma sintering without mechanical activation allows, allowed us to achieve full dense uh, composite. Okay, uh, the difference was in density, yes? Uh, Mostly, no. Uh, different, uh, no. In indentation, we use just for measurement of the mechanical properties. Uh, okay. Elastic modulus and micro hardness. Okay. This is uh, uh, during nano indentation processing. 
Okay. Uh, one more question uh, again from Olga Skoda. Uh, so we go to product with 100% uh, des density. Uh -huh. uh, the density was 100%. Uh, uh, you got a, a final product, and with the, and its density was 100%. Uh, yes. 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 It, yes. it was the, uh, what, uh, this is a picture, uh, scanning electron microscope uh, image of such sintered uh, full dense composite without any uh, pores. Pores, yes, thank you very yeah. much. Uh, more questions? I cannot say any questions to you. Thank you very much for talking, it was thank very interesting. Thank you very much for your answers. Uh, and now, time to uh, another speaker. Uh, also, the speaker, a guest speaker, with an invited talker. Uh, this speaker, Ekaterina Makhnova from Germany. Uh, she won a competition between young scientists and got a status uh, of a guest speaker with an invited talk. Ekaterina? Can you, he can you hear me? Could you please accept the invitation to be an editor, to be a lecturer? Oh, yeah, I think now it should be fine, yeah? Hello? Hello. You can start. You can start your talk, please. Hello, everyone. Um, Thank you for having me. I'm grateful to present the work dedicated to the development of effective biosensors using plasma polymer surfaces. Um, I would like to start my talk with the outline. First, I will highlight the advantages of usage of plasma technology for creation of thin reactive polymer surfaces. Then briefly describe the principle of used biosensing techniques and then present the results from usage of plasma polymers in immunosensing. But um, first of all, what is a biosensor? It is an analytical device used for detection of a chemical substance that combines a biological component with physical chemical detector. Any type of biosensing system consists of three major parts, which is a bioreceptor, uh, which contains biomolecules such as antibodies, enzyme, or DNA strains, transducer to convert biomolecular interaction into a useful signal, and the signal processor, which evaluates the obtained data. Uh, in this study, different immunosensors were developed, which means that the interactions between antibody and antigen were monitored. These interactions take place in human immune system and typically used for, in biosensing for detection of various diseases and pathogens. As you can see, the immobilization of um, by recognition elements are always required onto sensor surface. Uh, matrix, uh, so these uh, by recognition elements are immobilized on a matrix layer, which is also an uh, essential part of the biosensor. The, these matrix layers are typically created by bad chemical treatments, and all of them include surface activation by aggressive chemicals. The typically used surfaces are the self-assembled monolayer, organic polymers, or the most popular carboxymethylated dextran layers. Uh, the preparation of such conventionally used layers uh, is a really uh, long-term procedure and uh, includes a lot of steps. As an alternative, the position of thin functional coatings by plasma polymerization can be employed, uh, which is a one-step, solvent-free, eco-friendly process. The plasma polymerization has already been applied for the position of thin film containing carboxyl, amines, or anhydride groups. Uh, the transducers uh, used for biomolecular detection in this study were the quartz crystal microbalance and surface plasma resonance sensors. Uh, QCM is a relatively simple and sensitive device consisting of 80 cut uh, quartz disc plate covered with evaporated electrodes on both faces, allowing further immobilization of sensitive biorecognition elements. Alternating voltage applied to this electrode induces shear deformation of the crystal. 
the first sensing application uh, was developed after Sowerbray Sol derived a formula for changes of the oscillation frequency depending on the mass loaded on the sensor surface. Uh, the bioreceptor, in our case antibody, immobilized on the uh, surface of QCM crystal makes it highly sensitive to the target bioanalyte. In our case, it was antigen. The bioanalyte binds to, anti uh, to the bioreceptor and increases the mass loaded onto the surface, which directly corresponds to a uh, decreased frequency of the resonator. Studies were carried out in liquid environment using a flow cell and uh, phosphate buffered saline was used as a running buffer. Surface plasma resonance is an optical technique which measures refractive index changes in the vicinity of thin metal layers in response to biomolecular interactions. The light is passing through a prism reflects uh, mm -hmm, reflects off the best side of a sensor chip surface and goes into the detector. At certain incident angle, light is absorbed by electrons in the metal film of the sensor chip, causing them to resonate. These electrons are surface plasmons, which are sensitive to the surrounding environment. The result is an instant intensity loss in the refracted beam, which appears as dark band and can be seen as a dip in the SPR reflection intensity curve. The shape and the location of the SPR dip can be used to convey information about the sensor surface. So uh, for the binding event between immobilized antibody and antigen from a solution, there is an increase of angle of minimal reflection and the SPR curve minimum is shifted. Sensorgram allows to follow the changes of the angle of minimum reflection in time. Uh, so thanks to reactivity of carboxyl groups, carboxyl-rich plasma polymers are extensively employed for numerous biomedical environmental applications, including immobilization of biomolecules. In this study, an atmospheric pressure plasma jet was employed for deposition of thin polymeric surfaces for their use in biosensing. The radial frequency atmospheric pressure plasma jet was operating at 5 watts in continuous mode with one SLM of argon. Monomers for the Plasma polymer films deposition were tetrahydrofurfuryl metacrylate and 3 vinyl uh, cyclohexane, and a mixture of thereof with the volume ratio of 1 to 2. The distance between the jet outlet and the substrate was kept 5 millimeters. Circular movement was applied to increase uh, thickness uniformity of the deposited layer, and the process itself included three steps. First was the uh, surface activation by argon plasma treatment, then monomer uh, nebulization, and then uh, plasma treatment of the liquid monomer film until the formation of the film was complete, which is the plasma polymerization step. And plasma polymerization time varied from 10 to 30 seconds, depending on type and the amount of monomer. As far as uh, all of the biochemical procedures are carried out in an aqueous environment, the obtained plasma polymer films have to perform a good level of stability upon immersion in water. In our study, we carried out analysis of the uh, films right after the deposition process and after 24 hours of storage in water. FTIR analysis revealed the functional chemical groups present in the films and how to follow chemical changes after storage in water. Um, FTIR of the monomers were recorded to uh, be able to compare chemical composition of the resulting film with the corresponding non-polymerized monomers. Uh, in all the FTIR spectra of uh, freshly deposited films, OH stretching signal was recorded at uh, 3,500 uh, centimeter, and then the uh, CWO stretching uh, was uh, Seen at 1730, uh, uh, 1730, corresponding to different esters. So this signal was found as in TFMA derived films. Uh, only traces of vinyl groups were seen in the uh, plasma polymerized uh, surfaces, whereas in the monomers, uh, this was much more pronounced. So uh, according to the decrease of the signal, we can clearly see the conversion level of in the resulting uh, polymer films. Uh, for the, uh, all of the films uh, had the CH signals and all of them corresponded to different alkane frag fragments in their structure. After 24 hours of immersion in water, uh, there were no dramatic changes in the chemical composition. However, the overall intensity of signals was slightly lower. 
uh, compared to freshly deposited films. So the decreased signal intensities in FJR spectra were assigned to the thickness losses of the coating. Uh, the films were also analyzed by XPS depth profiling right after deposition and after 24 hours of immersion. Near surface, uh, all of the films had a high content of oxygen functionalities and uh, even for TVC film, which didn't have any oxygen in, in their structure. With the increasing sputtering depth, the oxygen content decreased, whereas the portion of carbon rose. And a sharp transition between the film and the silicon substrate was seen in all of the cases, with the peak of uh, in oxygen content uh, in uh, near surface region. Uh, not near, in, in, the, in the transition between the film and the substrate, there was and peak in oxygen content due to formation of carbon oxygen silicon interlayer due to plasma pretreatment of the substrate surface. Also, ellipsometric measurements were conducted uh, to determine the film thickness loss after storage in water. So, for uh, TVC, uh, TFMA, and copolymer film, the losses were 6%, 18, and 16, respectively. Uh, within the further 168 hours of storage in water, no more significant changes in thickness were recorded. The obtained results on the analysis of chemical composition of the studied films showed that the uh, plasma jet polymerization process uh, substantially followed a conventional free radical chain uh, polymerization pathway via vinyl or vinyl then bonds. Uh, an increased content of, uh, the, of oxygen in the near surface uh, region of films can be caused by post-oxidation processes, uh, reaction with the activated air molecules due to the radical nature of the plasma polymerization. So here is the reaction scheme of the oxi auto-oxidation uh, process. Um, another explanation of larger content of oxygen functionalities in the near surface region of the films uh, could be a higher uh, oxidation degree due to direct interaction of plasma with the surface. Um, the TVC film had about 10% of oxygen in its bulk, whereas the TVC itself didn't contain any oxygen at all. This uh, makes oxygen incorporation into a uh, carbon chain of the polymer evident. Uh, oxygen found in the bulk of uh, TVC film was mostly in the form of ether and aldehydes, which can be caused by the action of alkoxy radicals that are known to be reactive towards carbon double bonds and are typically used as initiators of free radical polymerization. The uh, morphology of the deposited film was studied by AFM, and all of the freshly deposited films appeared as smooth surfaces. Uh, just the copolymer film had a slightly uh, rougher uh, surface. Uh, a large increase of surface roughness after immersion in water was found in all cases. Uh, in case of TVC, there was, we observed the formation of rings. Uh, in case of TFMA, uh, um, there were pinholes recorded, or pinhole-like uh, dips. And the copolymer, copolymer uh, exhibit morphological changes that represented the sum of the rings and pinholes, which were the large donut-like structure that were found all over the surface, uh, the surface of these films. Uh, the, these uh, dramatic changes resulted uh, in an increase of surface area by about 15%. And generally, the increased total surface area can be beneficial for some uh, uh, for more efficient immobilization of biomolecules. After our thorough study of stability of the obtained films, we tested them as a matrix layers for immobilization of antibody molecules in QCM immunosensing. Uh, the biosensor preparation procedure included several steps. So first, the QCM crystal was coated with the plasma polymer film. Then uh, the film was immersed for 18 hours in water for stabilization. Then activation of carboxyl groups presented in the film uh, was carried out via reaction with uh, EDCNHS, which is carbodiamide succinimide chemistry. And then right after the activation procedure, antibody was covalently bound 
to, to the surface of the sensor. After each step of biosensor preparation procedure, uh, the changes in crystal oscillating frequency were recorded to confirm the successful binding event. After the antibody was binded, the crystal was inserted into the setup and the solutions of antigen were flown through, through the flow cell. Uh, the model pair of LA01 antibody and the human serum albumin uh, antigen was used to carry out our biosensing experiments. It is known that this pair provides a reliable immunocomplex under different conditions in the size format. Here are presented the binding events recorded as frequency changes. The sharp drop in the frequency values caused by the addition of antigen mass to the surface. Our plasma polymer surfaces offered a great performance of the uh, biosensors. We had a stable baseline, good regenerability, uh, selective and high response. Uh, different concentrations of antigen were tested and the calibration curve showed the linear behavior of the sensor response. After successful QCM tests, uh, SPR immunosensors using all three types of the obtained films were developed. The procedure for immunosensor preparation uh, remained the same, except that the SPR slides were inserted into the SPR setup after the stabilization step immersion water. The activation antibody binding and blocking steps were carried out online and sensogram of the sensor preparation procedure were recorded. During the immunosensor preparation procedure, the level of response of plasma polymer films towards the EDC, NHS, like the activation mixture, was similar to all of the cases, but the amount of antibody bonded to the surface was different. Uh, the largest volume of antibody loaded in the sensor surface was um, in case of copolymer film, which can be due to a larger surface area resulted from the formation of these donut-like structures that we've seen before. Uh, during the immune tests, uh, the performance of uh, TVC and the copolymer films was uh, based sensors was very similar. Uh, the TFMA-based sensor was, had the smallest amount of antibody bonded to its surface and was worse in terms of sensitivity and level of response. Even though the uh, TVC-based sensor had a slight drift and a relatively noisy signal because of the non-uniformity of its thickness resulting from high volatility of this uh, compound, the level of response towards analyte was slightly larger than in case of the copolymer-based sensor. Uh, the constructed calibration curves show the good li linearity in all of the cases, but the best agreement with their linear fit was achieved for the copolymer-based uh, sensor. So, to the conclusions. So, plasma-induced polymerization using atmospheric pressure plasma jet is an efficient alternative to conventional methods for creation of thin layers suitable for bioreceptor immobilization. A detailed study of the obtained plasma polymer films showed that plasma-induced polymerization under the described condition followed a conventional like free radical pathway with incorporation of oxygen into the film structure, mostly in the form of ethers. The stability of the plasma polymer films in aqueous environment was studied as it is critical for bioanalytical application and the general trend of no substantial thickness losses after 24 hours of storage in liquid was observed. The IFM analysis revealed different characteristic of morphological changes for each type of the plasma polymer film. The developed SPR immunosensors had the same sensitivity as the conventionally used uh, self-assembled monolayer and carboxymethylated dextrin-based immunosensors, but offered a better stability and regenerability. So I would like to thank you for your attention. Katerina, thank you for your interesting work. Very good presentation, very good pictures with good resolution. Katerina, can you hear me? Yes, uh, yes there was some problem yes. with now. Uh, you have uh, one question. Mm -hmm. Can you see it? Yeah. Could you please answer it? So this is the FM, yeah? So slide nine, how was the chemical composition determined? But slide nine is about the FM. Uh, 
or there, there is the slide 7 with all of the type of analysis that was carried out. So this is FKR, express the profiling that we are etching through the material down the substrate, so there is a clear representation of the chemical composition. Or maybe I do not understand the question. Ah, you can't understand the question? Uh, no. Slide 9. Can yeah. you find it? Yeah, this is about FM. FM doesn't give you chemical composition. Ah, uh, you didn't uh, determine chemical composition? Uh, chemical composition was determined by several type of analysis, like FTIR that I was talking about and XPS depth profiling. So you can here see the uh, summary of all of the chemical groups presented. And then the XPS depth profiling, there is the oxygen and carbon content uh, in relation to the like we are sputtering the material. Um, thank you very much, Katrina. Some so, some uh, noises. Uh. Ah, oh my God. Ola uh, Skoda, I I think you should ask your questions. Uh, just go to the forum and uh, find uh, the, this presentation and ask your questions. Uh, if you didn't understand, answer them. Okay. okay. No questions. Ekaterina, thank you very much. One more time. Uh, it was very, very interesting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now time to introduce our last speaker, uh, Sivalov Petrov from Tom. Could you please accept the invitation to be an heir, to be a lecturer? Okay. Yeah, do you hear me? Yes, 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 yes. Please, start your talk. So do you hear You can start your talk. I don't see my presentation yet. Ah. Now, now, now your presentation is here. Can you see it? Can you see your presentation? So, so while it's loading, I, I would like to welcome everyone. Uh, I'm very glad to take part in such event. And so I'm going to present the results of our work. And the topic of my talk is Pulsed electron beam assistance, assisted synthesis of nickel aluminum surface alloy. This work was done in a Tom Scientific Center. Uh, so why it's so? So I have a poor connection, and that's why I'm going to turn off my video to get maybe the best result to let you hear me better so the my okay. presentation of some steps uh, about the background methods we used the samples and materials we treated the main part is uh, investigations which i would uh, describe for you and the last part is a conclusions of all our work. So the carbon steels are widely used in industry due to their uh, relatively low price and uh, good workability. But this is not the only the reason to take this material as uh, uh, samples. Also, it's very, uh, convenient for the numerical calculations because it consists of mainly one element, uh, the iron. So in this work, we tried to uh, make a surface alloy of nickel aluminum uh, intermetallic alloy on a car low carbon steel substrate. The aim was to improve the mechanical operational characteristics of a substrate by using the surface alloy. 
So the experiments were conducted on experimental setup, the machine written SP, uh, which is based on the uh, source of low energy, high current electron beams, which was developed in High Current Electronics Institute in Tomsk. This machine uh, have uh, energy of electrons in range of 10 to 35 kilo electron volts, and the energy density of the beam can be varied from 2 to 10 joules per square centimeter. The beam diameter is, as you can see, uh, is about 5 centimeters. And also this machine is equipped with a magnetron pattern system to uh, make the metallic coatings on the substrates. So for the experiments, there were two, two types of the specimens made. The type one specimen uh, with the total thickness of the coating uh, at 2.5 micrometers consists only of three layers, nickel, aluminum, and again, nickel. Uh, only three layers. The type two sub, uh, sample consists of uh, more layers, 19 layers, uh, which are thinner than the, uh, the type one but the same total thickness of 2.5 micrometers. So we tried to investigate the difference of, in the forming of a surface alloy with a thin or thick layers. So uh, on this slide, you can see the morphology of the samples of type one at the left part of the screen and type two at the right part of the screen. So as it was uh, estimated, the thick layers allows, don't allow us to have a uniformity of the elements distribution after the electron beam treatment. Uh, that's why we tried to use a thin layers and here we have a good distribution of the elements but we have a cracks on the surface of the material uh, if we look to the cross section of the samples uh, we can see the same structure as we sh as it was have shown on the previous slides the three layers with the uh, total thickness about 2.5 micrometers and the, for the system number two we have 19 layers after the electron beam treatment the 19 layer system shows us quite uniform thickness of the surface alloy it's 2.9 micrometers or so about it with a quite uniform uh, border between the substrate and the surface alloy. In case of thin uh, layers, we can we can see the uniform border. There are some globules uh, which are rounded by the material of substrate, and the thickness of this surface alloy is 3.5 uh, micrometers. So as we look at the X-ray diffraction analysis, so for the initial material, we can see only the iron. For the nickel aluminum multi-layer system type one, we can see the peaks of nickel and aluminum also the same quite the same picture for the system type number two and for the surface alloys we can't see the peaks of uh, aluminum and peaks of nickel but we can easily see the peaks of intermetallic nickel 
aluminum uh, alloy. So this slide shows us the transmission electron microscopy and the structure which is also corresponds to the nickel aluminum intermetallic structure but in case of the thick layers we can also can see the circular structure which can be corresponded to a very small particles yeah. The next slide is about the wear resistance tests. The tests were also conducted for five samples. The initial one, number one, the two multi-layer systems with the quite the same results of a, a quite high wear coefficient. And for the surface alloys, we can see that the wear resistance is uh, significantly lower than for the multi-layer systems and for the surface alloy type number one, it is 2.5 times lower than for the initial sample. These tests were made by inon disk uh, system. And for the nano hardness, the same five graphs, and also uh, the initial sample and the multi layer systems have quite the same results of nano hardness about three hectopascal. But for the surface alloys, the nano hardness is significantly higher, up to two times to six pascals for surface alloy type number one. And also we carried out the high temperature exudation tests and uh, sulfide oxide corrosion test. For these tests we took the samples, uh, we put it into the high temperature and these three samples were tested for high temperature oxidation, just the high temperature and uh, the air. The lower row is uh, samples for uh, samples for the sulfate oxide corrosion tests. They were uh, covered with a uh, salt water solution and then they were heated also with the samples for high temperature oxidation. Here are the samples after the tests and the next slide is the results of the measurement of mass of these samples. As you can see the blue line corresponds to initial sample and this sample lose this its weight uh, much faster than the uh, surface alloys. As for high temperature oxidation, the speed of weight loss for initial sample is up to two times higher than for the sur surface alloys. Uh, in case of sulfate oxide corrosion tests, the difference is not so significant but also the initial sample have the worst result uh, and the surface alloys of both types have the quite the same uh, results of a weight loss. Uh, so at the conclusion I would like to say that the nickel aluminum surface alloy was formed on the substrate. We achieved the desired thickness of 2.5 micrometers. We done it with uh, different systems. So as it, it has been shown that the surface alloys consists mostly from the intermetallic nickel aluminum phase. Uh, the mechanical parameters, uh, the wear resistance, hardness of the formed surface alloy is 
higher in comparison to the substrate parameters in the tests of sulfate oxide corrosion and high temperature oxidation showed the best results for the surface alloys in comparison with the substrate. So that's all. Thank you for your attention. I'm ready to answer your questions. So thank you very much for your very interesting talk. And you have questions. Can you see these questions on your right? Can you see? The From, uh, question oh, oh, to the chat. Yes, uh, the first question was from Olga Skoda about slide six. Can you see this question? Uh, what is, is it, it called? The question to the chat. In the common chat, can you see the questions that have been asked to you? Slide nine, how would the. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's from the previous presentation about the slide nine, yes? My question is about the slide number six. Six, yes, number six. The EDS map, what is the cause of cracks that are filled with iron? Uh, this cracks uh, is a result of formation of uh, uh, key. Brittle, brittle. Brittle phase of nickel aluminum uh, intermetallic on the quite the uh, non brittle stainless steel. Uh, about the high quantity of the iron in inside these uh, cracks, I think I will uh, I will discuss it with my colleagues and we will answer you a little bit later okay okay then uh, a question from sergey fedorov can you see it yes i can see it отвечать мне здесь по-русски или по-английски на этот вопрос but we uh, if you need the help from interpreter, you are welcome. Okay. Okay, the question was, is it possible to compare the elements and the surface layer uh, after beam treatment and after diffuse, diffusion annealing, for instance, uh, annealed at uh, 1000 degrees C during four hours? And the, the answer is that, uh, uh, unfortunately, there is no answer because uh, such experiments were never conducted. Okay, the next uh, question okay. from Olga Skoda again. What is the maximum number of layers received? Uh, in this uh, experiment, we received 19 uh, layers. That was the maximum quantity of the layers. Okay. And uh, from Anton Baranowski. Uh, did you treat the substrate somehow before deposition? Yes. The, our usual technique includes the pre-treatment with an electron beam. Okay, uh, I think that's all. Thank you very much for your answers and Thank for you. your talk. Thank you. Oh, one, oh, no, no, no. No questions. No questions. Okay. Dear colleagues, uh, uh, I think that's all for today. We are finished on our session. Uh, and uh, I would like to remind you about uh, several possibilities. Uh, presented our Congress. Uh, if you want to continue your conversation, communication with the authors who presented their talks here, you can do it. Just go to the forum placed at the website of the Congress and ask your questions. Also, uh, it's very important uh, all the pres talks uh, presented, presented here will be recorded and will be available during the whole Congress. 
uh, one more important thing. If you want to hold a special meeting with uh, special people, uh, like a, a, a round table, something, something like a round table, just address uh, the organizing committee of the Congress and uh, uh, indicate the time and people you want to invite. Uh, I think that's all. And of course, I would like to thank all of you, all the participants, for attending our conference and asking your questions. And of course, I would like to thank all the speakers for interesting talks, uh, presentations, uh, answers. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, one announcement um, today at uh, 5 o'clock p.m., a plenary lecture will be held. Uh, don't miss it. I think that's all. Then see you tomorrow to continue. Good luck. See you. Thank you very much.